Well, it's six o'clock and I thought maybe we'll get started here. Welcome, I'm Pam Pepper, Mayor of Indianola. Welcome to the Indianola Zoning Code Update Meeting. I will now happily turn it over to Chris Shires. Welcome, Chris, thanks for being with us. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, very excited to run through this uh, with uh, you tonight. So as I advanced uh, screens, for tonight's meeting, we're gonna provide an update uh, of this zoning code uh, process that we've been running through. We're gonna walk through why we're doing it and the timeline that got us here. I'm gonna go through all those uh, code uh, zoning chapter updates, and then there'll be time for question and uh, comments. And then we'll kind of recap with the next steps of where to go from here. Uh, so uh, throughout the presentation, and then uh, towards the end of the presentation, primarily, uh, feel free to use the chat feature within this uh, Zoom webinar or the question and answer feature. Um, if, if I notice one or Charlie, who's also uh, with us, uh, notices one that I can answer maybe immediately while I'm running through the presentation, I'll stop and do that. Uh, but primarily, I'm going to look to, after I've run through the entire code update, uh, spend time as, as frankly, as much time as you wish, uh, hearing your comments and responding to your questions. Okay. So why are we doing this? Uh, so kind of multi-reason. Uh, one of the couple of the big reasons is really to update some outdated regulations uh, that are difficult to apply today. Uh, we want to improve that predictability and consistency of our development review process. We want to address some certain areas of concern and conflict uh, within the existing zoning code. And we want to update regulations uh, to address certain changes uh, in state code or some of the uh, case law uh, that regulates and manages how we can uh, uh, handle zoning. And uh, finally, uh, we want to meet some of the goals and long-term uh, 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 processes identified in the comprehensive plan update as important to Indianola. Okay. So this uh, zoning code and subdivision regulation process has been broken into two phases, And right, right now we're talking about phase one, which is occurring over this year. Uh, and we were uh, updating things related to the definitions, what are the permitted uses, our zoning districts, a concept called accessory dwelling units, and I'll get into that uh, a little bit later, home occupation, uh, outdoor sales and storage, solar, uh, energy, architectural uh, guidelines for new buildings and construction, open space buffering, screening landscaping, off-street parking, uh, our site plan review process. And also included uh, after we get through this step, uh, we will be updating the city zoning map to be consistent with uh, whatever the uh, desired changes are to the zoning code ultimately. Process-wise, we started uh, last uh, August uh, with a, uh, an advisory committee meeting, uh, running through with them uh, what they saw as important to update, areas of concern in the code, uh, some of their preferences. Uh, we also had a series of interviews with community stakeholders, uh, property owners, business owners, developers, other interested parties on where they saw issues and uh, areas of concern within the zoning code and really opportunities for improvement. We went through a series of plan drafting and review meetings with your city staff. Uh, and then here in uh, April, we have been meeting with that advisory committee again to uh, formalize this preliminary draft. And then we are here tonight uh, presenting that to the public. Uh, and then, uh, and we'll go through this also at the end. Uh, out of tonight's meeting, we'll make additional edits, review this draft with the city staff, get it in a more finalized format. And then our goal is to take it to the planning commission at their public meeting on Tuesday, May 11th. And then assuming the commission uh, approves it uh, for recommended approval at that night, the first meeting it could hit to the city council would be June uh, 7th. All right. And then after this, after this part of the code update, the next section of regulations we'll hit will be sign code, wireless communication facilities, sometimes we call those cell towers, our subdivision regulations, parkland dedication, and some streetscape uh, standards. So for tonight's presentation and what we're gonna be reviewing are these uh, updated chapters of the zoning code. And you may have seen on the city's website, a link to the current uh, city code that includes the zoning chapters, as well as uh, the draft that we're gonna go through tonight. I'm not gonna go through that draft page by page. That would take way too long. I'm gonna hit some of the highlights that hopefully those who may not have read that code 
uh, can find those sections they're most interested in, focus in on those, and then uh, comment back uh, directly to the city should you have questions or comments uh, that you were not able to ask or uh, didn't think to ask at tonight's uh, meeting. Okay, first we're gonna uh, start off with the title purpose jurisdiction and really the establishment of these zoning districts and the map. It's a lot of boilerplate language, kind of a standard thing to have in there, but I am gonna pause to talk about uh, the establishment of districts uh, as where that has changed. And so this is some of the standard thing we put in zoning codes and what your zoning code uh, has today. We have to give it a title, the jurisdiction that this is covering the city limits of the city of Indianola, how we interpret uh, standards, the districts we're creating, and the zoning map. So currently, the city has 13 different zoning districts. We're proposing to consolidate them just a little bit uh, into 11 and make them a little more specific. And so I've kind of highlighted some of the changes. Uh, we will still have an A1 Ag District, but we're proposing that we don't need the A2 Mixed Use or Mixed Ag District. The Single Family District will be refined a little bit, but still in place, the R1. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, points that we wanted to update between the R2 and R3 district today and the R4 district to make them more specific. And we'll go through the use matrix, so I'll explain that later. Uh, but the R1 district is generally for single family residential homes, whereas the R2 district would be for duplex, buy attached, townhome, row houses and the R3 district would be for multifamily residential, typically apartments and condominiums. The uh, planned residential district and the planned commercial district are proposed to be eliminated into a just a new planned unit development uh, district. And a planned unit development is where you can write a specific zoning um, code or, or plan at, well, along with a master plan uh, to do something special, uh, do a special unique development that doesn't fall say within our current uh, set of zoning districts. Not a real common thing for us to do in Indianola, uh, but it's a good tool to have should you have a special development uh, that needs maybe its own special rules and regulations uh, to meet its uh, desired goals. Uh, we still have a changing the title a little bit, a mobile home district, but it'll be called a manufactured home uh, park district. The office commercial C1 is uh, turning into neighborhood commercial, really what its intent is, still have highway commercial, and then general retail office C3, uh, we're, we're changing it to a downtown mixed use zoning district, really meeting the intent of how that C3 district's being used today. And then uh, there's still the M1 and M2 uh, industrial districts. Okay, uh, in uh, the second chapter, procedures, amendments, and enforcement, it's a lot of boilerplate. Uh, feel free to read through it, uh, but I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time going through that. Uh, this is where we talk about needing building permits, uh, that we have a zoning administrator, how the Board of Adjustment works, uh, issuance of certificate of occupancies for new buildings and changes in uses, how we do amendments, applications, fees, penalties. The definition section has been substantially updated to modernize uh, a lot of definitions and add new ones that we need in order to properly regulate uh, and uh, uh, manage our zoning code. I'm not going to go through that. It's quite lengthy. Uh, but as you're reading through and you have a question about a definition or term, uh, that's where you would, you would turn to. There's a little bit in the uh, general provision section that we want to run through. Uh, and this uh, uh, generally covers things related to how we think about single family commercial office lots, industrial lots, what happens when we annex property, um, street frontage requirements, uh, making sure that we have visibility at our street intersections, uh, some things like that. I'm going to talk, uh, review a little bit with you some of the specific lot and yard regulations that I think you may be most interested in, as well as accessory buildings and structures. Think those detached garages, sheds, things like that. Uh, this section also in includes uh, fences and walls. Uh, that may be in interest to some uh, people. Uh, so please feel free to read through that. Uh, on your own, and then non-conformities. And this is how uh, should we, you know, rezone a property or a property uh, be have a different use or structure that is not uh, currently allowed or permitted in its zoning district, but it's what we call a legal but non-conforming use. Uh, how do these regulations apply? How do those uses apply? 
So on the lot and yard regulations, we this is a clarification to, to on how we uh, interpret uh, building setbacks. And for your purposes, you might think of this, uh, how it applies to say a single family house. And so uh, what we're saying here is that those typical things that are very common to project from a wall plane, like steps up to a house, eaves and overhangs, fascias, parapets, cornices, bay windows, uh, can extend up to three foot into a required setback, front yard, side yard, rear yard, uh, but still can get no closer than five foot from a, a lot line, typically a side lot line. Uh, front stoops, stairs, open decks, uninclo unenclosed porches may encroach up to six foot into the required front yard setback. And so this could be a porch with an overhang, it just can't be an enclosed porch, can't have uh, full walls. And then stoop, stairs, decks, um, not enclosed or covered by a roof may encroach in, up to 20 foot in the rear yard setback. So think again for a single family house, that's say your uh, backyard patio. For accessory buildings and structures, uh, this also typically applies only to single family duplex, duplex townhome row houses, uh, not to commercial multifamily um, office industrial sites. And their garages, sheds, play structures, gazebos, pools above ground and below ground uh, that are not attached to the house. We're saying that these must be located behind the front line of the building of the dwelling in this case, can be in the front yard, need to be maintained or kept 10 foot away from the house, five foot from the side and rear yard lines, unless they're up against an alley and then we need a 20 foot setback off the alley. There is a limitation on the number allowed, no more than two of these per lot, no greater than no no greater in size than ten percent of the total lot area, up to a maximum of eighteen hundred square feet. That would allow a pretty darn large garage if you uh, had a pretty large lot. But there's a caveat that uh, in, uh, that uh, you still could have up to a six hundred square foot uh, garage should you have a very small lot. And then there's a max height of twenty four feet or one and a half stories tall. Next section I'm gonna roll through is zoning district regulations. And this may be the one that is of greater interest. Uh, this is where we define all the uses, setbacks and regulations for those different uh, zoning districts that we've updated. I'm gonna focus in on the zoning district setback regulations, we call them bulk regulations, and then everything else, the setback and bulk regulations for non residential uses, and then what uses are permitted, and then I'll get a little bit into what is a special use. Uh, also in this uh, section uh, are a lot of uh, other requirements, uh, such as dealing with wind turbines, solar systems, accessory dwelling units, and I'll get into those, home occupation, and then there's other things that tend to uh, apply more to commercial properties, having outdoor display, exterior uh, lighting, um, screening of, of uh, trash enclosures or uh, of trash uh, containers, making trash enclosures, typically for commercial office, multifamily properties. Okay, within this section are some tables. Uh, the first table you run to after you go through the list of zoning districts is the one related to uh, all the residential uh, zoning uh, districts. So the, the uh, A1 through R, uh, three. And in this case, uh, we break this out by use type instead of zoning district, because you could have a single family house in an A1 ag district, as well as an R1 district, and on occasion, an R2 district. So we want those setbacks to be con consistent between uh, types. Same thing, you may have a townhome row house, say in an apartment R3 uh, zoning district. So it matters more of the building use type. And so you see that we have single family dwellings in ag, single family dwellings detached and semi-detached, which is a fancy way of saying those traditional duplexes where they each have their own lot. You have two family dwellings, and that'd be a dwelling that has two, two uh, units in it, but it's on one lot. Townhomes, row houses, typically anything that's uh, two or more units attached or three or more units attached horizontally. Uh, that's different than when they're attached vertically, like in the case of an apartment or multifamily dwelling. And then non-residential structures in residential districts, schools, churches, municipal buildings, civic buildings. 
And so as you look at that, we set minimum lot sizes, minimum lot widths measured uh, typically at the front setback line, minimum street frontage. So you think when you have a cul-de-sac, that frontage at the cul-de-sac bulb starts to get really narrow, uh, but we still need a minimum so we can fit a driveway. Uh, you have your front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks, rear yard setbacks. And then in the case where we get into like townhome developments or more than one dwelling unit on a, on a, on a lot, we need some setbacks between units, between buildings, between uh, apartment buildings. Uh, and then sometimes we have private streets, so we need to make sure we're clear on that. What are their setbacks? We also have maximum building height, minimum open space, and then dwelling units per acre. So in the case of townhome row house, that max a number of dwelling units you can have for every acre of property is eight. And then the max on apartments would be 20 uh, apartment units per acre. And then there's a lot of little uh, caveats to address some special things uh, that typically we see. Very similar to what you just saw for the residential districts, uh, we have the ones for all the others. So the, the commercial districts and the industrial districts. Uh, these are a little more specific to the districts versus uh, to the building type, but the same things apply. Uh, minimum lot width, street frontage, front yard, side yard, rear yard setback, separation between buildings, maximum building height, um, open space required. And in the case of the C3 district, which is a mixed use district where you could have residential uses, uh, setting a limit, a, no, a max number of dwelling units per acre. And I should have st uh, stated early on, those setbacks are generally consistent with it's in the code today, especially uh, related to single family residential. Uh, the next uh, section within this area of code, this chapter of the code, is what we call the permitted and special uses table. And this is a very lengthy table where we break down, we categorize all types of uses into these big, uh, big blocks, and then there's kind of the subcategories underneath. And so the first one in this case, agricultural uses, and we list them below. And then the next one is residential uses, and we list the different categories below. If we list under the, and then across the top, there is then the zoning districts. If when we, where we list P for permitted, that is a permitted use. Uh, you can, depending on the use, pull a building permit, submit a site plan application, and away you go. You don't need, there is not a zoning step. If there's not a P or an S in the box, it is not a permitted use. It is not a possible use within that zoning district. The S stands for special use, and that is a use that might be appropriate in that zoning category, in that zoning district, that, but will require the review and approval of the Board of Adjustment following a public hearing, and our code spells that process out. So in this case, uh, folks may be most interested to see in the A1, R1, and R2 that single-family detached, think of those traditional single-family homes, are permitted in those districts. Whereas the R1, kind of our standard single-family detached residential district, uh, does have the ability that somebody could seek a special use permit for the Board of Adjustment to build a duplex. However, townhomes, two-family units, multifamily units are not a permitted use within the R1 district. When we go to the R2 district, which think uh, a part, uh, 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 townhomes typically uh, you can see where uh, townhomes and row houses, where you could still do a single family home, a duplex, a two unit, townhomes and row houses, but apartments are not a permitted use. And then when you go to the R3, which we think of as the apartment zoning district, you can't do single family because we're trying to separate uses a little bit, but you could do duplex, two unit, townhomes, and of course, apartments. And so the code kind of continues and builds that way. What we also show is this concept of an accessory dwelling unit. Sometimes we think of them as granny flats, mother-in-law suites. Uh, in other situations, you might think of you have an apartment that you can rent above your garage. Uh, a little more common in other areas of the country than it is here in the Midwest or in Iowa, uh, but it's something that uh, your uh, comprehensive plan did uh, consider as a way to kind of increase uh, the amount of uh, housing options available in the community. Uh, but there are some stipulations in this. If you're going to have an accessory dwelling unit, uh, there's a couple of different types, and I'll, I'll get into this section of the code again later on. Um, it could be within your house, 
It could be a separate structure. It could be, say, above a garage. It can't be larger than your current house, has to be uh, subordinate, if you will. And the owner has to live on the property. Uh, those are kind of the big caveats, as well as you need a special use permit from the Board of Adjustment because they're going to review things like, do you have adequate parking and what it's going to look like? I'm not going to go through the entire table because it's lengthy, but I kind of want to show you how it works. Uh, so then we, under the commercial uses section, we kind of list commercial uses by their intensity and type. Uh, but one thing I did want to note is um, we, we have restaurants and we list, you know, where uh, they are permitted, as well as where drive through facilities are permitted, because a lot of different types of uses have uh, drive throughs bank, dry cleaner, restaurant. Okay, oops, and that went right out of order. There we go. So uh, a couple of other provisions in this uh, section of code. Uh, we did add a new uh, section uh, related to solar energy systems. So photovoltaic panels, solar collectors. Uh, but there are two uh, uh, concepts on how these can apply. You could uh, allow them, and, and we're proposing that it's permitted by right, obtain a building permit, and you could put one on your house or your commercial business. So on the right side of the screen, we show what a roof mounted uh, system would look like, say on a house or in the, the image below uh, on say an industrial office building. Actually, this is the office I'm in right now. On the left uh, side of your screen is what say a freestanding ground mounted array would look like. And so what we have proposed in the code is that it only be rooftop uh, mounted and that with a few provisions to try to kind of limit the visual impact of that, but still a permitted type thing. Uh, there are some folks that have commented, why don't we allow it on uh, in a ground mounted situation? Uh, we did propose in the code uh, that say ag uh, zoned property or industrial zone property greater than 10 acres in size uh, could uh, could do that uh, if it's in, say, the rear yard area. So that'd be something I'd be interested in a little bit of discussion, say, uh, at the end of the meeting. You know, real quick, and I'm going to go back to this because I just saw the, the question pop up. So can you explain the reasoning behind the 30-foot minimum setback for R, all of R1? And so... I can look at my screen here. I don't know if you can see where I'm tracing. So the front yard setback in R1 is 30 foot. Uh, and that is out of your, your current code today. So we weren't proposing any drastic changes to uh, your building setback standards, specifically as a rate like to say a single family residential. Uh, that's what your code says today. And communities are a little bit over the board. Some of them go down to, to 20 feet. Some of them go up to 35 and 40 feet. So it's really a community preference, but often we have to think of having enough setback to also accommodate a driveway. But that's a good question. Also within this chapter is thing, uh, are the accessory dwelling units again, with some very specific provisions. And again, the, the reference back that they have to be owner occupied. The owner has to occupy one of the two units and it does require a special use permit from the Board of Adjustment. We also uh, kind of consolidated and clarified and created a standalone section for home occupations. These are businesses you'd run out of your home. Uh, all those typical customary ones are listed. We do state that not more than one person who doesn't live in the home uh, can be employed at that home occupation. You can't use more than 25% of the floor area of the home. And we have some limitations on the number of customer visits, say to pick up product, uh, in essence, uh, uh, this also has language in here to say you can't have a perpetual garage sale. It's not a retail operation. Uh, you can uh, have customers purchasing, you know, pick up product that they've pre-ordered at an arranged time from you, but a limitation on that. Uh, we're also stating within the code uh, that all those child care homes and child development homes as defined and regulated by the state of Iowa, the DHS, uh, would be a permitted home occupation. And uh, it's a little bit lengthy what the state of Iowa has, but they have child care homes, which is of a limited size, limited number of children, and they require a registration. Whereas child development homes are a little larger, have a, a larger number of children allowed, and there's different actual 
uh, licensing required and extra standards, depending if you're a category A, B, or C, and including the number of providers, which is uh, generally not more than one additional employee. And then uh, there was a question on uh, manufactured homes. Uh, I can sure go back to that. Um, uh, basically, we're not messing with your current manufactured home ordinance, uh, just a little bit of refresh and update to it, and including uh, just maybe a few little uh, tweaks and provisions in there, uh, just clarifying it. Uh, we do uh, need to have a manufactured home zoning district. Uh, it'd be really hard as a community not to have that. Uh, but whether you zone an area for man a manufactured home uh, park development uh, is definitely a, a, a commission and council decision. I hope that answers that question. Okay. All right. So under the site plan regulations and procedures, wanted to touch up on a few changes that we're proposing with this on how we manage site plans. Uh, this section also deals with a little bit on design standard. We didn't change that too much. Uh, and then uh, condominium conversions, just how if somebody does want to take an existing or new apartment building and uh, go into Iowa law and change it into a condominium regime or a housing co-op, how does the city code uh, regulate and address that? Uh, so first, uh, you do need a site plan application and a site plan to do uh, uh, anything. Uh, that is a common thing, whether you're building a fence, a garage, a new single family home, an ag building, or a commercial building. Uh, but that level of site plan and the process does need to differ based on what you're asking. Site plan for a, a fence can be very, very simple uh, and should be very simple. Uh, a site plan for a home uh, doesn't need a lengthy review process either. And so ag related and single family dwellings, their accessory structures and fences just need to submit a set, uh, basically whatever a sketch plan the building official needs in order to issue a building permit. Everything else does need a little more of a formal site plan and a process, uh, but we've set up two types, a major site plan and a minor site plan. A major site plan is when you're building something new, something substantial. So a new apartment building, a new townhome a development, a new commercial building, a new industrial building, something like that. And we're proposing that those would be first reviewed by staff and, and your agencies reviewed by the Zoning Commission that then sends a recommendation with uh, conditions as necessary to the council for review and ultimate approval. However, to make life a little easier, things that may be more minor in change uh, could be reviewed and approved administratively by your zoning uh, administrator, uh, provided there's no increase in the number of dwelling units, they're gonna meet all the zoning code requirements and uh, other code requirements, uh, that they're not gonna add more than 2000 square feet or go tw above 20% of the current building size. The next section is off street uh, parking regulations. Uh, there's a lot in this one as well. And this has been consolidated. Your current code is a little cumbersome on trying to find where all these different rules and regulations are. So it's all in one chapter now. Uh, so we include the design standards, how many parking stalls are required, and some other rules and regulations. I'm going to hit some of the highlights. Uh, so first, uh, what we're clearly stating in here is that all parking must be on a paved uh, surface. You can't park on grass. You can't park in your front yard. Uh, same thing with, say, a boat. Now, if you're an industrial property and you have your industrial storage yard, there are some separate rules for you there. But this is to clearly state you can't park on you know, on the lawn, on the grass. Uh, the parking table also lists the number of required parking spaces, and this is based on use. And uh, for residential, it's typically at least uh, one parking space uh, per dwelling unit. Say for a single family, it'd be two. And we also clarify what are those setbacks for parking lots, typically applying to commercial properties or industrial uh, multifamily properties from the front yard and the side yard. And then we allow some flexibility uh, that if it's kind of a complicated use, 
uh, that we can have an alternate method, method for calculating parking. And that if we don't think we need all the parking that we could actually defer that parking until such a situation where it's really needed. Um, we also have a standard in here that if you have a building, commercial or office building over 5,000 square feet, that you have to provide some sort of uh, bike parking. And then um, another new one, but I think most people really like this one, is if you have a similar use, you're adjoining to a similar use, you need to interconnect your parking lot unless there's a, a practical reason why you, why you can't. Uh, I, I know there's no greater pet peeve of most people that when you're in one big box retail stores parking lot, and you want to go immediately next door, but you got to drive back out onto the street and then you know, pull back in. They're mutually beneficial. Now, what I'm not saying is that you'd have a McDonald's interconnect to a church parking lot. Those are two very dissimilar uses, but a McDonald's next to a Burger King, Hy-Vee next to Walgreens, something like that. You know, these retail uses and other similar uses sure can interconnect their parking lots uh, for everyone's mutual benefit. Now, I can't promise we can go back and fix uh, the existing situations because this does apply uh, to new construction, of course. Uh, and then we've also proposing some limitations on driveway widths once they hit the street right of way line. We want driveways to be able, in the case of single family, to be able to accommodate uh, parking in front of their house, parking in front of their uh, garages. And so the general provision is, is once you hit the street right of way line, typically about at the sidewalk, you got a neck down to 24 foot in width, uh, but you can still then apron, uh, widen out your driveway uh, to be as wide as uh, your, your garage. So if you got a three car garage, you can widen out there and still add one more additional wing of parking. And so these diagrams on the screens uh, kind of show that. Uh, we don't have a maximum coverage for front yard. You could still pave quite a bit. And you can still have a 24 foot wide driveway, say you don't have a garage. Uh, so we do want to accommodate off street parking. Uh, the one of the questions that was just raised, uh, are homeowners allowed to park on their front lawn? No. Uh, and I, I, I'd have to say, we're, we've clarified that, but that's, that's also in your current code. And so that would uh, generally be a thing not allowed. And then we've clarified that you couldn't park, say your camper, your boat, your car, in your, even in your backyard on grass, needs to still be on hard surfacing. Okay. Then in the last section, open space, landscaping and buffering. Uh, there's quite a bit to run through on this one. Uh, and this is a consolidation of, again, some of the things that are in your code today, but putting it into one chapter. Earlier on, you saw that we had an open space standard uh, set for all the different zoning districts, not necessarily a really steep standard, 20%, 25% open space, uh, depending on the, the uh, zoning district. Uh, but we have some uh, landscape standards related to percent open space. And again, this applies only in new construction or substantial addition remodel, uh, uh, something uh, pretty significant. And typically, most of this is applying, again, not to single family residential, commercial office, industrial, uh, multifamily residential. We've also clarified some of the buffering requirements, landscaping within parking lots, and then the plant materials list. The review and approval process, and that this landscaping must be maintained and replaced if there is die out. So what's in the code, and this is consistent with your current practice, and again, this only applies in brand new construction, so a new subdivision with new homes being built. Uh, the requirement is two trees and four shrubs per single family lot. All other situation, it's tied back to the minimum amount of open space required. So for every 2,000 square feet of required open space on a site, I have to have one shade tree, two ornamental trees, and two shrubs. Now we have some additional provisions for parking lot landscaping. Uh, and this diagram is trying to detail what we're talking about here. So we have to, we're requiring landscape islands. And again, this is for commercial, office, multifamily, uh, that type of use, not single family. Uh, anywhere you have a parking lot of a certain size, uh, and again, in new construction uh, or a substantial remodel renovation of an existing site, uh, that you add landscaped islands at the end of all rows, parking rows, that all parking spaces need to be within 100 foot of an overstory tree, a shade tree. And then if we're fronting the parking lot along the street, 
which sometimes we are, of course, that we're going to have one shade tree and two ornamental trees for every feet of every 50 feet of uh, frontage. And a uh, requirement for some sort of a three foot tall uh, screen uh, from the parking lot. We sometimes call it a headlight screen uh, along that street frontage. And it can be accomplished with a, a, a variety of either doing earth berming, uh, landscape material, shrubs, ornamental grasses, uh, or even a low masonry wall, uh, something of that type. And so just some images kind of showing that trying to green up our large parking lots. And then that little bit of landscaping along that uh, street edge really can help soften a site. And if done right with some sight line uh, investigation, you can see still see your building wall signage. And then later on, when we update the sign code, you'll be able to see your, your ground mount monument signage. And wait till we get to the sign code next year. That's even more work. Okay. We also have some standards for buffering between dissimilar uses. And so, and again, this is gonna apply in, in new construction or new scenarios. Uh, can't necessarily go back and retrofit these in. Uh, say you have a, a C store, a gas station being built next to a single family home. They need to install either a 30 foot wide or a 60 foot wide landscape buffer. And then in the code, we have provisions for both. If you're doing a 30 foot wide landscape buffer, you have to do a certain amount of trees and shrubs, evergreen trees with some berming. If you're gonna widen it to 60 feet, if you have the land to give, uh, we kind of reduce that landscape amount. And if you, the site is kind of squeezed and it's impractical to do this type of buffer, uh, the city can approve, say, some type of a buffer screen uh, wall. This provision also requires double frontage lots. So this think a single family residential subdivision, again, new construction, something that would occur after the adoption of this ordinance, that the homes back up to an arterial roadway, a roadway where they're not gonna have their driveways. We call those double frontage lots. They're getting their driveway off the internal street, their house backs up to a major street, uh, another street. We call those double frontage lots. In that situation, we're recommending that they be required to have a 30 foot wide landscape buffer park and that they actually not have a fence within that, uh, that their backyard starts uh, after the buffer. And in fact, the building setback line is measured from that buffer line so that they still have the standard backyard that they can fence in uh, but this is an addition, a add-on to their backyard. Uh, this has worked in other communities. I know this one can be a little controversial with the building community because we are making the subdivision wider, but we think it helps keep those homes um, having long-term value, especially if they're backing up to a pretty significant roadway. Uh, it is a good buffer and it helps green up your street, your city, uh, that you have this green frontage uh, versus kind of the calico mix of uh, fences. Uh, Prime example, your, your neighbors to the north, if you drive Highway 28 in Norwalk, uh, especially right off of Highway 5, you head south, you see that kind of mismatch of different fences right on this, uh, the highway right of way line. It's not the most attractive thing and, and that community would agree. Uh, and in fact, they have this same type of provision uh, now to not have that scenario going forward in the future. And I hope that is clear as mud because that's a hard one to draw a diagram. I should have taken a picture along Highway 28. I didn't see any questions come up on that. Okay, and we're doing pretty good on time. My goal was to be less than an hour talking and give you guys plenty of time to ask questions. But the building design standards is something that is new and, it, and there's a lot to it. And so we, we have to define it, its intent, why we're doing it, what it applies to the exceptions and define some terms. Um, I'm gonna run through some of the general provisions, that table of exterior building materials, and the standards by which we apply them. And so we're applying this again to new construction or additions that are less than 20% uh, of the original building size. And this is cumulative. You couldn't come in and do a bunch of little additions and try to sneak at, uh, uh, sneak under the, uh, the rules on this. And I'm gonna talk a little bit of what's called building facadism, application of materials. So, uh, building facadism, a prohibition on that, uh, that's where you do a fake element to, to try to meet some kind of strange design uh, requirement. Uh, 
And so in these, here's some pictures of that. Uh, these little kind of fake screen walls and fake little parapets uh, that really don't serve a purpose. You sure could do a parapet, uh, but but our, we're wanting architecture that's real and authentic. And I think Indianola has had good success or, uh, with that over the years. When we use different types of materials that be, should, should be used in the way they were truly designed. And a lot of this is really coming back to, we really hope you hire an architect or, or a design professional that knows what they're doing. And so on the top picture, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is an example of thin set brick, lick and stick uh, brick, sometimes we joke and call it. Uh, the, the image below shows the proper use of this type of material. Uh, the wall has a dimension to it that, uh, that allows this brick to real, read as if it's real brick. We have uh, actual brick corners, cut corners, there's a course on top. So when you see this as a finished building, it would look real. Whereas that example above is really where you're putting brick, uh, this thin set brick material, and this is a glazed version, uh, more as a lick and stick version, and it looks fake. Uh, it's poorly done, uh, and it doesn't read well. It doesn't look authentic. Uh, same thing if you were to put stone um, on a, say, roof dormer or stone uh, above uh, uh, siding. Uh, it looked like it's floating in space. Sometimes we even see if we put stone above a garage door or something like that. It doesn't look authentic. And so there's a lot of little tricks like that that don't necessarily cost more money, uh, but help buildings look better, help the community kind of uh, have that architectural character that they're hoping. Uh, the other one applies to just that screening of mechanical equipment, those rooftop units, air conditioning units, pipes, utility meters, uh, through whether architectural design or physical screening with walls, landscaping, uh, can really go a long way without adding a lot of cost uh, to a project. Uh, that picture on the top, I won't tell you where it is, uh, but it's a really, really nice building. And I think even the building owner and definitely the building designer had to be super frustrated when the mechanical uh, guy uh, installed the meter bank where they did. And this is like front and center on this building. It is along the street view uh, with the rusty uh, gas pipes running up the side. And they're streaking on the building today. Uh, we also uh, want to push the appropriate use of trim and overhangs and soffits. Not all building architecture requires that or should have it. Uh, but in traditional building architecture forms, uh, it can really go a long way. So the image on the top shows that good use of trim Whereas on that building on the bottom, sure would have been better with some trim. Uh, sure would have been benefited with just a little bit of trim. And so that's what we're talking. This is also an example of, you probably should have had the brick on top and the stone on the bottom. It would have read better. Stone tends to, we think of it as a heavier base material. Uh, and then um, wall articulation. In fact, both these images are row houses, townhomes. Uh, both are also good examples of really well use of trim. Uh, and with some of the more affordable siding material. That top picture is all vinyl siding, uh, but they're using all those quality trim pieces as well. Um, in this case, every unit looks like uh, you can define, this is my home, this is the area I own. Uh, in the case of the top one, they're changing some of the materials, changing the roof line, and the bottom one, they're doing even more dramatic pushes in and out of the wall line. Uh, it, it uh, can be very effective to kind of softening the impact, say, for a multifamily property. And often multifamily is not really popular in a community because people are concerned about that visual appearance. Okay. Now, with that, we've, we've tried to classify building materials uh, into some categories. We call class one, two, three, and four. Class one and two are those top materials, what we really want to see a lot of depending on, on where it is. Class three is kind of a standard or base material. And class four is a material we tend not to want to see very much of, especially on the street face. And most of what I'm going to go through next, we'll talk about street facing facades. And we break all these materials into some big categories. So masonry and stone. And you see where we have a uh, real brick and brick veneer, class one. And that, that's that thin set brick I was talking about. That's class two. And then all the different forms where we can do brick paneling, stone paneling, stone veneer, uh, terracotta, rain screen, stucco, some things kind of get valued higher and lower. And then concrete mason units, concrete block. But there's some really great ca concrete block like cast stone, which is a really, really nice material. Uh, so that can be a class one. Burnished and ground face, uh, ground face block, 
pattern block, uh, but plain block, like uh, my house foundation, we kind of think of that as a lower valued material. We don't like to see that along the street facing facade. And then concrete in all its very many forms, we have some really nice uh, tilt up concrete uh, product out there now that really, uh, really high end office buildings are often seeing that. It has a finish, it has an integral color. We call that architectural grade or architectural quality. There's some really nice cast in place stuff. Uh, and then there's some more affordable stuff or some more standard stuff uh, that we'd see on say an industrial building. Um, oh, and then I see my fonts there glitch. They're all little smiley faces. Um, so that here's everything related to metal. And so there's all types of metal siding and metal paneling. So that top quality, architectural quality, composite metal wall panel system. Uh, funny enough, this stuff can be actually much more expensive than real brick. Uh, it's a very high quality product. Same thing with that next one. Uh, this is when it's an architectural quality metal panel that's insulation has insulation in it. And we thought those were both class one. And then as we kind of go down the metal, uh, we, we kind of uh, value it a little bit less till we kind of get to just standard metal siding as a class four. Then we have glass on the bottom, clear glass, curtain glass, glass wall systems. That's one. We love that stuff. We think of that as a high value material. Uh, and then you kind of see some of the other stuff where tinted glass and mirror glass, a little less so. Uh, but spandrel glass, we think of that a lot for office buildings. Uh, and that's basically it's a, uh, a glass that has a color or enamel coating baked into it. Uh, we often use that in a de uh, designing an office building that is all glass. Uh, we try to do a little definitions and pull out brand names where we can just for references. And then we kind of have all the other materials. And where this is where you'd probably spend most of the time kind of arguing what's the class of some of these. Uh, so cement fiberboard, think hardy plank siding. Some love it, some don't love it as much. That there's a more a higher architectural grade of that uh, by uh, uh, Nichiha. Uh, you know, so that's up. That's valued higher. You also have vinyl siding. We tend to value that a little bit lower. So with all those different categories, and we did the same thing with roofing materials. Going forward the community could make adjustments to this over time, add a new material as it comes on the market or upgrade or downgrade a material. And there's a flexibility written in the code that should something be shown to you as, oh, wait, that's a pretty high quality. I think it's more like this material. You as the city commission council staff uh, can make that kind of value decision because this, this will be one of the harder things uh, to implement as the city going forward. And, and it would also be the one section that I would say in a year or two, revisit and don't be too scared of uh, to make an amendment to. So I didn't show ag buildings and single family residential because basically we're not getting too specific and trying to have any uh, building material requirements on them. Uh, that's a real tough one to regulate. Uh, so we are jumping straight to townhomes and row houses. And in this case, we're saying that, and when we say primary facade, it's generally the street facing facade where the, where the street is, must have at least three different class one, two or three materials or four materials. Uh, they have to have a mix of materials, pick three. So window and one kind of siding and say some brick uh, stone at the base. There's your three materials. Uh, need to have its own deck, patio, rooftop, uh, some type of uh, outdoor space like that. And we want each individual unit, so showing those same pictures, to have its really own uh, facade uh, to be differentiated uh, somehow. And so both of those pictures are, are ways that that's been done. So vertically attached residential, that's a fancy word of way of saying apartments, condominiums, uh, we get a little more strict. And so in this case, have to have three different materials, but only from class one and two. So those are those higher value. Again, on those street facades covering at least 40%. So in this case, brick, window, um, stone, or another type of uh, masonry product covering at least 40%. And if they do a lot of windows, you can get there pretty quick. Um, have to have the good quality roofing materials, no elevated walkways, uh, each uh, dwelling unit, again, should have its own porch, patio, deck, rooftop, patio, or shared amenity space. So sometimes our developments are doing dog parks and gathering spaces and barbecue pits and things like that. Uh, that would also be appropriate. 
And in this case, since apartment buildings start to get bigger, uh, we need that facade broken up at least every 60 feet, pushing and out of the wall plane, uh, something uh, like that, or columns. And so this is a building example, and this image is trying to show that. Now we have non-residential buildings in residential zoning districts, churches, uh, civic buildings, schools, things like that. Um, so we have a, a slightly enhanced standard. Each street facing facade has to have three different class one and two materials that make up at least 50% of the building facade, have to have the quality roofing materials, and again, must break up their facade uh, at least every 60 feet with a change of wall direction plane, uh, something like that. And so here are examples of uh, another building that would meet that standard. And then in commercial retail, uh, get a little more strict yet. And again, this, just the street facing facade, so not all sides, uh, have to have uh, three different class one and two uh, materials, but now up to 75% of the building facade. Plus we're saying that that street, uh, first floor street facing facade or main entry has to have at least 20% uh, clear glass. Uh, the more clear glass on a retail store anyway, the more inviting it is, the more we like it. This is super important also in your downtown, and I'll, I'll, we'll get into that section in a little bit. Again, this is applying to new construction or substantial remodel, and we want that wall broken up every 60 feet minimum. Office and, and uh, civic buildings are very similar, other than we don't have that first floor glass requirement. Now, mixed use, uh, this is where we're using that same higher standard, three different uh, facade materials comprising at least seven, 75 percent of that street facing facade and then that and i i mistyped that it should be 30 percent uh clear windows on the first floor my typo uh, not 20 percent. so just a little bit higher in our downtown area we do want windows where we can see into businesses and stores um, businesses know and in fact if you look at how casey's Come and Go and Quick Trip have remodeled, especially Quick Trip and uh, uh, Come and Go. Their stores now have three entrances, three sided entrances, and a lot of glass because uh, they know that they've learned over time that customers want to be able to see in. Restaurants have learned over time customers want to see in. So uh, a lot of our retail change, chains are redesigning their buildings. Downtown is the same way. The more you can see into a business, the more likely you're going to take a chance to walk in. When you have no windows, uh, blocked windows, filled in windows, you tend to be less interested in going into a business because you can't see what's going on. Is it safe? Is it interesting? And so we really do want to encourage that uh, definitely in, in, in the downtown square area. And hopefully over time, uh, property owners and businesses will see that value. And then industrial buildings, we tend to slow down the requirements. Uh, they are what they are. Uh, so only uh, two different uh, class one and two and three materials on 80% of the street facing facade. So a little bit easier when we add, throw in that uh, class three material and uh, trying to do those facade interruptions every 100 feet. Okay. Look at that. I almost did. I, I stayed under, uh, under an hour. And I know that was a a lot to run through. So just a reminder of those chapters, and I can sure pull up the code. Should somebody have a very specific question, uh, I'm happy to run through that right now. So feel free to, uh, through the question and uh, answer feature or the chat, uh, ask your questions. If there's anything I can review in greater detail. Hey, Chris, just really quick. This is Charlie Desau and Community Economic Development Director for the city. I just wanna clarify one thing. When you answered that question on the parking on the grass, um, our current code actually, it, it does somewhat allow for parking oh. on the grass. What it says is it says, no person shall park, store, permit uh, the parking or storage of a vehicle in the front yard for more than 48 consecutive hours oh. except on a driveway. So what that piece of code says is that you can park your car on the grass as long as you don't do it for any more than 48 hours. So the code that we are proposing yeah. to adopt here does fix that um, regulation and no longer does allow for it at any point in time. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know you had mentioned that was a carryover from our code, um, just does modify it a little bit. And then the other item, um, can you quickly just explain the PUD? Because um, <laughs> right now in our code, yeah, we have that PRD and it actually does have some specific um, setback requirements, lot size requirements associated with it. Um, and I know PUDs, again, they're not meant to 
um, be a, an avenue for a developer to potentially get a bunch of variances from normal residential standards that we have in our code. But um, it's a little bit of a, a change from what we have right now. So I think some further clarification on that would be helpful. We actually um, did have a development here just this last summer that went through that process. So it is a little bit fresh in some people's minds. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Charlie. And so in your current code, you have those two different, in essence, PUD districts, planned districts, planned residential, planned commercial. Um, and that's a little bit of an older way of doing it because sometimes we're going to do a development that is mixed use, horizontally mixed use. You can have some apartments, some retail, maybe some office, and you're wanting to do some kind of unified development. And so what our proposal is, is just to create a PUD district. So in essence, you're going to zone a property planned unit development, but you don't just zone it planned unit development. What goes along with that is frankly its own ordinance and its own uh, development plan, its own master plan with specific standards, building architecture, other guides and regulations uh, to uh, create that special development. Um, what, what this really is a tool that if somebody's wanting to do something very unique, say some type of cluster housing, um, you know, uh, uh, tiny home development, uh, wants to do some type of uh, a mixed, horizontally mixed use uh, commercial retail uh, office development uh, with its own special signage, signage standards, building design standards, uh, even maybe special setbacks, that this is a mechanism, a tool in which you can do that without trying to struggle, well, let's zone part of it this district and part of that district, or I don't quite have a zoning district that addresses it. What it's really hard to do is write a zoning code to the perfect, to 100 percentile that covers everything that could happen. We tend to write to the 90th percentile of everything that could happen and then allow the PUD as its own mechanism. So the PUD itself is like its own uh, mini uh, zoning code. You may reference sections of your current code, but typically you're setting building setbacks, landscaping, signage, whatever special things you want to address uh, and cover. Um, so I, I, I hope, Charlie, that went into enough detail. Uh, some communities do a lot of PUDs, and you're right, sometimes it is a way to get around a rule or use it to get a variance from a setback. I sure wouldn't do a PUD for that. There to create uh, some kind of very unique special development. And they're actually a negotiation between the city and the property owner. You can't zone as a city, a property, a PUD without the property owner actually signing off on it. You actually can't amend a PUD to change the standard without the property owner signing off on it. However, you can always un turn it off. You can always shut it down and rezone it something else, a straight district. Because uh, as a city, you ultimately have zoning authority. Uh, but the PUD is a little more of a special negotiated uh, agreement on zoning. Okay. Maybe I made that too complicated. Uh, but in this case, we're trying to keep this and not have specific standards of PUD. That's what your zoning district's for. PUD is to be able to create a brand new special zoning uh, for a, a unique development being proposed. I'm going to go through in order here some of the questions. Uh, the, the first one that was asked, uh, I believe the wording regarding sheds, and this is on the, under that accessory uh, dwelling in it, or I'm sorry, accessory structures, sheds, garages, uh, things like that, think single family residential again, uh, that they uh, be behind the front line of the house. Uh, doesn't this mean they could be right beside and visible from the front of the home? Uh, short answer is yes, and that might be something you want to think about and comment on. Um, and this comes in a case of sometimes you have a really wide lot and you may have a detached garage that's right next to the house, or you may have a shed that's right next to the house, but still not in front of the house and still not within the front yard setback. Now, in a corner lot situation, both the side of the main front yard and that side front yard have to meet that front yard setback and you still have to push that accessory structure back uh, to be in line or not in the front yard setback. Uh, so if that is something that is of, of issue that you truly want it only behind uh, the principal structure, we could sure adjust that. But we tend to say it behind the front face and front yard setback, kind of whichever is most restrictive really, can't be in front of the house as kind of that, that first stopping point. Because you think sometimes you have an L-shaped house or a house with a, a pretty large addition uh, to the rear, it'd be hard to keep pushing your detached garage back far enough, especially if I have a wide enough lot that it could kind of be off to the side. Um, 
had another question uh, related to mowing requirements for undeveloped lots. The zoning code does not address that. Uh, the city's nuisance and property maintenance codes do, and I frankly don't know the answer. Typically, there is a uh, maximum height, and sometimes it does depend on whether it's developed or an undeveloped lot. Yeah, and Chris, really quick, I can answer that. Um, we actually covered that in our property maintenance code, and that was an update um, that we had to our city code back in June of last year, I believe. But um, for developed areas of town, so that's if you have a single family dwelling, it's uh, not to exceed eight inches. Undeveloped, it's not to exceed 12 inches. Um, and then there are also kind of setback requirements. So if you have an undeveloped lot right next to a residential area, you still have to maintain it down to eight inches. I think it's within 10 feet of any of those property lines. So um, that is a change that we actually made last year to kind of uh, uh, increase some uh, regulation that we had with the undeveloped lots. Okay, and I'm just gonna move here for the next question. Um, uh, what are the, let's see. I, I, I may, I think this one's slightly different. So requirement and uh, requirement and maintenance rules for undeveloped lots to be, and I'm assuming prairie grass. Uh, so we do have just a little bit in there uh, about landscape maintenance in general, not necessarily, you know, mowing of grass because um, different types of ornamental grasses have different heights. And so we do have the ability that you could do uh, prairie grass plantings. Ornamental grasses up front, okay. Low maintenance, low mow grasses, though, uh, do need to be in a rear yard and a back, a back uh, area. So you could have a situation where you have an undeveloped lots where they purposely done a prairie uh, grass plantings. So I think that's something that, uh, that could be allowed um, uh, in the ordinance, have to be kept weed free. And, and typically maintained, which is a yearly mowing or yearly burn off, depending on what's allowed, whether you can do burning in town uh, for prairie grass with a permit. Um, another comment, should electric vehicle charging stations, stations be added as a permitted or special use or at least added to the table? You know what? I think that is a great idea. We're gonna add that to the table. Just to make sure that's not a, Uh, and uh, can, comes up as an issue later on. Uh, okay, and then I wanted to flip to the uh, bulk regulation table for residential uses. Uh, so what is the minimum lot width you mentioned? I went through that a little too quick um, and that concern related to density, row houses and apartments. So let's talk about that. So for single family, we have that minimum lot width of 60 foot, uh, pretty common and standard. Uh, some communities will graduate that and have one district that they're 60 and another district that they're 70 and another district that there's 80. We would recommend that that can be a little more cumbersome and to give your community a little more flexibility in providing the housing sizes and types uh, that market demands is that you just have one district. Uh, house being built on a 60 foot wide lot, brand new house is still going to be a nice house. Um, we do. Uh, uh, have some um, uh, minimum standards when you go up to say a uh, semi-detached, or I'm sorry, for a two family, you get a little bit wider, but that's because you're, you're putting two families on one lot. And we have that minimum lot area, uh, both the 7,200 uh, square feet for the single family is kind of that, that minimum. But if I'm understanding the uh, question uh, right, the minimum lot width for say townhome road dwelling uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on what that is, uh, because what is a, a one real standard development style is to do townhomes and row houses when they're going to be owner occupied. Uh, they're either going to plat individual lots or they're going to plat something called post stamp lots. And we've added that as something that, that could be done in your code. And it's basically where you're putting a little tiny postage size lot, a lot tiny lot around the actual dwelling unit and say five foot outside that dwelling unit. Uh, but it's a part of then uh, within a larger lot that is the common area. What I think is probably more of a concern to the community is the setback between buildings. And so right now, what we're saying in the code, if you're going to build a detached structure, detached dwelling unit, not attached to any structure, your minimum lot size is 60 foot, and you got to have it on its own lot. 
You couldn't, without doing a PUD, build a bunch of single family houses all on one lot, one big three acre, 10 acre lot. Uh, if it's single family detached, it has to have its own lot and those are the minimum standards. If it's a two unit by attached, it also has to have its own lot, minimum 70 foot, uh, 70 foot wide, 8,400 square feet. Now, townhome, we divide as, uh, we define as being attached to three or more units. So a three unit, uh, three in a row, four back to back, side to side kind of a, a layout. We don't get too hung up on minimum lot size because we have that density standard. What's more important is what's it set back from the street, public or private. And if it's a public street, it's going to be set back because we have the perimeter development requirement of 30 feet. So it'll kind of look like a single family house. Um, and then it has to be side to side set back 16 feet. So there's 16 feet of, of clearance between a threeplex and a threeplex or a threeplex and a fourplex. And if they're back to back, because they're all sharing in one big lot, we got to be either 46 foot back to side or back to back. So that I think is some of the concerns I heard about density uh, congestion and that eight dwelling unit per acre, you know, that, that'd be on pretty much on the max end of trying to do a typical townhome development. Uh, but you might have a kind of a row product uh, that might get kind of close to that eight. And that's why we thought that might be a good standard. So I hope that clarifies um, uh, that intent there. Okay. And let's see, uh, for the buffer requirements, can you confirm that the three foot earth berming is required in addition to the trees, et cetera? Yes, uh, that is the, the, the recommendation. Also what determines that they do a 30 or 60 foot uh, buffer between uh, 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 lots or between uh, dissimilar uses. So a commercial property to say a single family property. In this case, it would be an option. You could either do 30 or 60. If you do 30, you have to do more landscaping. If you do 60, you get to do less landscaping. So it's kind of a little bit of an incentive that if you got land to give, you, you don't have to put in as much landscaping. If, if it's a little tighter, uh, you could use the 30. Uh, that's what we're proposing. Um, oh, and then a suggestion to Google Smart Flower Solar Unit and consider adding this to your code. I will do that. I'll look to see what that is. Um, and I know somebody asked, did we get to the uh, solar uh, section, and we can sure go back to that and discuss that because uh, we really wanted to kind of hear some input on do you want ground mount uh, only roof mounted, building mounted, roof mounted, or would you want to allow ground mounted a little more commonly? And I think that's more of an aesthetic issue uh, for discussion of the community. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to do one more on the QA and then I'm going to make sure I don't ignore the folks using the chat. Uh, you review the requirements uh, for separate balconies for apartment units. Is there anything in the proposed update regarding using those balconies for storage? <laughs> and uh, will apartment complexes be required to have their residents park in the, their lots rather than on the adjacent streets? Boy, that's a, that's a great comment. And so, no, I don't have anything. We don't have anything in the code that they can't use them for storage. Um, let me think about that. I'm not sure how to address that. Uh, I, I guess the only thing I've ever seen people do, pardon me for my phone going off, the only thing I've seen uh, folks use uh, balconies for is storing a bike, grills, patio furniture, but I suppose people could go a little bit crazy on that. And then... About the parking in the lot. So we've updated the parking uh, standards to say it's, you know, um, um, one parking stall required per bedroom. So a three bedroom unit needs three parking stalls. A one bedroom unit needs one parking stall. So kind of a good universal standard. But we've had a provision that if they do garages, unless those garages are specifically tied to unit. So like, Sometimes we have garages that are in the first floor of an apartment building and you enter the garage and you can go immediately into your unit. Unless there are a garage like that, garages only get a half count. So if you build a four unit garage, you only get to count two parking spaces as fulfilling that need. Because I do know that we have an issue with 
uh, in general, not an Indianola thing necessarily, people don't necessarily rent garages or they rent them for storage or <laughs> people not even in the apartment complex will run them for storage. Apartment owner will rent them to whoever will, will pay the money. And so uh, what I would hope with this, this new parking standard, as well as the, the, uh, uh, the standard that even townhomes have to have off street parking, uh, help alleviate some of that on street parking uh, concern. And I've, I've heard that from other folks as well. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to, well, let me make sure I have everything else answered before we go on to this solar. Because I just want to show those pictures. So, because uh, somebody asked earlier, did he or did did they join too late? Well, heck, heck no, you're you're right on time. Uh, so related to this discussion, so we've added a, a section related on uh, solar energy systems, photovoltaic, and they could even be heat solar collector, but that's very uncommon now, but sol solar photovoltaic is typical. The code, what we've written today says roof mount only, follow a few rules, come get a building permit, and you're on your way. Ground mount, and I have those images kind of on the left to show some different styles. Uh, ground mount only say an ag industrial and only if you have say like a 10 foot or a 10 acre lot uh, just to, to kind of maybe not have these say in single family front yards um, with tree cover these these ground mounted ones are a lot less popular they tend to be more popular say if you have an acreage or you have a, an industrial property with a lot of extra space because they do take up land it's kind of low hanging fruit to have them on a house roof or on a, uh, in case of an office building uh, on the uh, low slope roof. And so that was kind of the first step into this. Um, I think this is a community preference. Some people think they're the greatest thing ever. Some people might say that these are not the most attractive things when they're ground mounted. Uh, so I would look to your guys's uh, recommendations and then we can run it on to the commission and council for ultimately uh, those folks to decide. And I'm gonna see, we have a little more responses on that. Uh, yep, just uh, making support for uh, uh, solar. And I think solar will be the, the kind of the new wave or continued uh, wave here in Iowa. Um, you know, if you look at like Fairfield, Iowa, uh, uh, very successful. I know we have it on our building right here in Des Moines. Um, more so than say uh, wind energy, that's much less efficient in town. Uh, so uh, one of the questions is, can you explain how the proposed regulations would apply to current properties that do not meet the regulations? In most cases, they're not going to apply. Uh, this only applies when you're building new or building a substantial addition or tearing down everything and building new. Uh, so uh, if you are going to build a new garage today, after this is adopted, the new garage has to follow this rule. If you're going to build a new house after this is adopted, new house has to follow these rules. If you're going to install a solar system after the adoption of this, it's going to follow these rules. If you've got one today that was permitted and that was legally installed, legally permitted at the time, or you legally built a garage and now doesn't meet these setbacks, uh, we call that legal nonconforming and it's a grandfathered building or grandfathered use. And you have a section of code that we didn't change uh, that addresses that. And so there are provisions that, you know, if it was destroyed, uh, you know, in a fire or natural disaster, uh, beyond a certain point, it couldn't be rebuilt without uh, coming into compliance. Uh, we didn't wanna try to make too many nonconformities. So we didn't mess with building setbacks uh, that greatly. Uh, but we did push the design standards. That's really what a lot of this code update has to do with looking at parking lot, parking lot counts, how much we need, landscaping, uh, building design. Uh, and there is a, an allowance within the, uh, the, the building regulation uh, standards uh, that should it be not make sense to do this addition uh, to, to come in compliance with the new standards because it, it, it kind of ruins the site or doesn't look right uh, that you can make allowances for that. Hopefully that was clear as mud. So a lot of this is going to apply to brand new sites or somebody's tearing down something and doing something new or a pretty big building addition. Let me make sure I didn't miss one. 
Are there codes needed for us to support downtown and traditional neighborhood developments with greater connectivity and trail use? Um, I don't know if there's anything specific related to zoning that you'd need to add in addition. A couple of things that are that are included in this code that I didn't go through uh, specifically in the off street parking regulations, we do have a requirement we want our buildings and our sites connected to the public sidewalk or trail. Next season here next year when we get into the subdivision regulations, we'll be looking at parkland dedication and provision of trails. And so I think that's where we can start meeting uh, more of that desire, especially at, as it relates to your recent comprehensive plan update. you're a diehard group to keep listening to this guy talk for an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, uh, here's a question I can't answer. When will we have a park behind uh, the Walmart area? Anybody want to take that one on, Charlie? Yeah, I can really quick. Um, you know, as part of the phase two updates, we are going to be looking at a parkland dedication ordinance that will uh, definitely assist the city in implementing our comprehensive plan and where we show future park locations. So uh, it's something that we do not have in our code right now. Um, it is something that our comp plan update addressed uh, when we adopted that back in May. So um, Chris mentioned that I think earlier in the presentation, but that is part of our phase two updates and that's gonna coincide um, with our new subdivision regulations. For those of you who are, who are with us, does anybody have a preference on, do we want to allow these ground mounted um, solar panels, photovoltaic panels a little more freely and not just on large 10 acre sites? Um, or do we want to keep to rooftop only? At a minimum, I definitely say you want rooftop. It's a good thing. And there's some provisions in here to not make them you know, uh, too garish, but still that you can do it. It's it's really an aesthetic decision. Oh, uh, let's see here. Are a few more just popped in? Uh, let's see. There are uh, are there any requirements that would cover dilapidated buildings, i.e., sheds, on a property with a new home being built or on an existing home. Uh, so uh, Charlie talked a little bit about the city's uh, recent uh, property maintenance code. So Charlie, you might have something about dilapidated buildings. Um, yeah, that's kind of a kind of a little fuzzy area. If you have an existing lot, an existing house, an existing garage, and you knock down the house and you want to re replace the house, um, chances are you know you could leave that garage alone. Let's say it's not meeting one of the setbacks. But I think your question's a little bit back to dilapidated, and so I think that's probably more of a property maintenance code uh, requirement. Um, yeah, and I, and I can jump in on that. That is, we do have a dangerous building, um, unsafe building code um, that we've used in a few instances um, with some examples. Uh, I think that's kind of similar to what's being pointed out within the city. So um, it, it's all an enforcement thing. Um, enforcement sometimes uh, can get very tricky, especially when you don't uh, get compliance um, from the person you're trying to enforce on. So, uh, but yeah, we do cover that in there. Um, and uh, we have used that. And if anybody uh, knows of any of those around town that would uh, that you'd like us to take care of, just please um, let the community development department know about those. We sometimes joke that we uh, in code enforcement don't necessarily go looking for trouble. Uh, and so sometimes a, a phone call from a neighbor is helpful. Uh, let's see here. Uh, did have one person comment, hey, you know, rooftop would be my my preference. Um, and then another question uh, said about a st a storage unit uh, zoning. Can you review that? Oh, uh, yeah, let's just go to that. I don't know that I pulled that section of the use table. Let me stop sharing and switch screens. Okay.
Oh, oh. <laughs> my PDF is too big. Do you see it just crashed? Darn it. Please forgive me. Chris, you want me to share my screen? Yeah, I, I almost have it up. I just did. It, it collapsed. Okay. Unless you want to go, unless you have it open right now, go for it. I can, I can get there. Okay. I, you know, Charlie, I just got it. So much easier in person sometimes, right? All right. So I've zoomed in on the use table. And so we have mini uh, warehouse or self storage uh, facilities, uh, and then in the different zoning districts. And in this case, indoor only, and there's that's been uh, even a more popular thing where they're doing multi-story uh, storage buildings. Uh, it's permitted in your industrial districts only. And then outdoor storage, say campers and boats and cars that you're gonna put in a lot, uh, again, only in your most intensive uh, um, industrial district, your M2 district. I hope that uh, answers the question. So that would mean one of those mini storage buildings couldn't go in your downtown district or in your commercial districts. They need to go to industrial. And the guys that build them really like to be on the big streets too. So there might be a little bit of pushback on that one, but that's your guys' decision to make as a community. Um, one person did comment, thought ground mounted solar is okay with appropriate requirements. And I, I'm, I believe I'm gonna get some more feedback on that. Um, another one thought rooftop. Okay. Now I do have the whole use table open. Oh, let me go to this other side here. Another thought, if we're going to do ground mount, maybe the, those could be special use permit, uh, but not straight out permitted. Um, and maybe there's even a lot size requirement. So allow maybe on a smaller lot, maybe it goes down to say five acres or something like that. Uh, yeah, so I think those are some things to consider. So instead of jumping up and saying, we can only do the ground mounted solar on 10 acre lots, what if it's five acre lots and maybe has a little bit less to do with zoning and we have to go to the board of adjustment for a special use permit. and even a combination of thereof still allow permitted for 10 acres and above. Uh, one question, are there uh, modernized street standards uh, we should take into consideration uh, with a focus on safety for drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists? Boy, great question. And that's more of a complete street or street design uh, standards kind of manual or specifications. Typically not something uh, we put within the zoning code. Uh, zoning codes, we tend to think uh, it's everything outside the public street right of way. Uh, so it's all in essence on private property. Um, I, I think that that is something that uh, your probably your comprehensive plan does have kind of as a kind of a bigger picture discussion is complete street street design, making it uh, better for bikers, walkers, cars, all, all users. So I appreciate that comment. And uh, so Chris, you, you are correct on that. Our comp plan does uh, have that as an implementation measure. So we hope to get to that at some point. Yep, and there was a comment there on the chat just to make, make clarify uh, that maybe solar needs to be, and I'm assuming ground mounted, but solar needs to be special use permit. Many communities require cell towers and other structures of similar obstruction to be special use. Yeah, good, good point. And if we go down that path, there may be some additional uh, standards or regulations to give some guidance to the Board of Adjustment. So it's not just quite a as much of a jump ball to them 
it's not so much fun as a, as a board member to have to count heads in the audience to see which way to vote. They should have some standards by which to decide. Any other questions or other areas of this code you want me to drill into a little bit more? And I think we had everybody's question answered. Um, if we have not answered your question, there is the option to uh, raise hand at the bottom of the screen there. <laughs> Just uh, do that and we can see whose question we're answer. We can try to go back to that one. Or if I glossed over it too quick. So uh, Bill, did I, uh, William Howard, did I me mess up yours? I don't, and maybe either type it again um, or send either directly to me or Charlie or in the uh, Q&A or jump in. Yeah, there we go, I, even better. I, I just, I, I allowed you the opportunity to join in if you want and um, just kind of talk live rather than do the chat. So if, if there was a comment that you had, uh, feel free to jump in. Yeah, Charlie, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, I've been typing and evidently I don't know what, what I'm doing, which is kind of normal. But uh, Chris, I'm uh, Bill Howard. I'm with the Sustainability Committee. And uh, I've talked about all the members and we are adamantly opposed to the way this solar energy system mm. code is written right now. Okay. Uh, to begin with, on uh, the three and 12 roof or less, you're only allowing a 12 inch offset and you've got a six inch mount, so you can only raise that panel six inches. You're gonna end up with a, a 8.53 degree angle on your panel, which is useless. Optimum Are you saying a 12, a 12, four pitch roof? Uh, a, a three on 12. Well, those are pretty rare. Uh, building code would say you can't do shingles on a three twelve, So we don't tend to see well, those in residential construction. You, you've, got, you've got it written in your code here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And I, I, that's why if you actually have like, Hey, this is what I'd recommend. Write all this. I, I, I that's why I meant in the chat, boy, send those send those to me. I would love to have it, especially from an expert group like you guys, where you're thinking and living and breathing this all day long. I, 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 I would really value that. I, I think Charlie has all the information. I emailed it to him earlier today. Mm, great. And yeah, because the way it's written, I mean, it's, it's useless for a flat roof. And there's so many, there's so many reasons we ought to have ground mounted solar it's not even funny i mean if you've got a bad roof you, you can't put a solar system on it unless you're going to tear the system back off and re-roof in 10 or 15 years if you're shaded you can't put solar panels on there a, a ground mount it, it takes care of so many problems easier maintenance and and i, I just as bevington today the City, the bank over there has got a 23K ground mount and they've got signs all over. They're proud of it. Fairfield's got them and they have a lot of pride in them. We ought to be encouraging solar instead of discouraging it. And the way, the way this solar code's written, we're discouraging solar use. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, uh, some excellent comments. And one thing I, uh, the intent was not to discourage uh, having an angle on low slope roofs. Um, uh, some of that provision, and I actually see now when I'm reading this, kind of the confusion in that. So I think there is room for some clarification. Some of that pitch and standard uh, is related to when you're actually putting on 412 and above, uh, kind of the more uh, standard residential roof. Uh, so your low slope uh, commercial roof, uh, that's not the intent to say, 
you can't have any pitch. I mean, you know, mine on this building are pitched pretty good. Yeah, well, you're saying 12 inches only. And, that, and that's that, standoff from the, 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 the sloped roof. roof. Yeah. So I think that's a good one for us to clarify. I appreciate that. Most codes that I've looked at in solar allows five foot elevation. So, yeah, and I think it's, there's a huge difference between whether it's on the side of a, a house's roof or versus on an, you know, commercial building's yeah, low slope right. roof. Yeah. Yep. I think that's, that's a, a good comment for us to fix. But I definitely think we ought to have a ground mount solar. Because it, it solves so many problems. Well, and I appreciate your uh, your comment about even roof repair. Before we put ours on this building, we did a brand new roof, uh, just yeah. so that wouldn't be an issue. Since they have about a twenty year life, and the roof has a thirty year life. We we have a heel house here in town that is waiting on a fifty thousand dollar grant. Solar designs already been done and it's a ground mount under this provision they couldn't even do it so so there, there's a lot of reasons to have ground mount like i said fairfield all the businesses down there got ground mounts and they're proud of it they're displaying them so i i think ground mount is uh, uh, really an answer for a lot of problems if I can ask you from a, from besides that roof pitch on, on that, that standout or uh, uh, angle from the uh, roof pitch and, and fixing that up, was there anything else in this? And I guess you're, you've already sent uh, Charlie comments. So maybe I want to ask, um, do you think like in some of the chat, some of the people commented, well, what if we, you know, say, uh, you know, certain situations, the, the ground mount needs to get a special use print from the board of adjustment. Well, I, I think it depends on the size of the system. If you look at most solar codes, I sent uh, Charlie a link for uh, uh, best practices in zoning for solar. Mm -hmm. It's put out by the NREL. He has that link. And if, and if you look, they break solar system down to three different sizes. The small systems, they don't even require anything other than a permit for ground mount. Okay. Maybe so, like cl that smaller standalone array that I had in my images. Yeah, right. Sure. So, you know, I think you need to break it down in sizes as far as your ground mount. But, but I think, I think, I mean, if you've got a well shaded house, which helped your energy efficiency, I don't think you want to go cutting trees down in tree city into NOLA. Right. To put solar on your roof. And a ground mount, you ha might have sun all over your backyard, solves the problem, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's my comment. So I think, yeah, there are several things we need to look at in that. But yeah. I think I sent most of it in an email that Charlie received, so. Well, perfect. Well, Bill, I, I definitely appreciate you doing that. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, and especially your time tonight and giving us some comments. So that that's why we're here. Yeah, and Bill, um, I, when, it, when we're done with this, I think Chris and I might even try to reach out to you just to kind of maybe go through this a little bit more to make sure uh, what, we're, what we're looking at here kind of meets with the Sustainability Committee's working at. I know um, Al Ferris, who's on the Planning Commission, was also on the Steering Committee and provided some good feedback on that too. So uh, if you I, want to meet at some point kind of off here, we, we're more than willing to do that. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I like that idea. I think Al's on here too. He might be having trouble like I was getting in, but but uh, yeah, I'd love to meet. All right. Sounds good. We'll do that. Great. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Anything... I any questions at all or comments? And I it's, uh, thank you for uh, some folks that added some additional uh, comments in the chat. So I think this will be one of those sections of code that we got to spend a little more time on and make some refinements to. Hey, Chris, one thing I wanted to clarify, the one of the first questions that came up about the accessory buildings and, and excuse mm -hmm. me for one second, because 
I lost that um, the code that I have here. Let me get to it. But it, it basically I, like sheds being at it can be up to the front line of the house. Yeah. So we and and you might recall, and I was looking at it. We actually carried over the existing regulation that we have in place right now that only allows for them in the rear yard. Well, maybe I wrote that down wrong, Charlie. So and I'm I'm getting if you go to one sixty five oh four, it would be the. I'm still familiarizing myself with some of this, so give me a second here. Yeah, um, that section D, it says accessory buildings and structures should only be erected to the rear of any principal building. And then no accessory structure shall be located between any principal building and any street, nor shall any accessory structure extend past the front face. Okay, no, I you're, you're right, I'm wrong on that one. And and it, it's one of those, and this is a tough one, and I, I think you guys brought up a good one to kind of review and think about. And I almost want to draw this out, but if you think you got a, a little bit wider of a lot and you got a detached garage, um, but your house kind of extends back, you know, there's plenty of situations where that detached garage may start uh, in line with or, you know, halfway through the the side of your house because it's an l-shaped and you have an addition that's running into your backyard a little bit because you have a, a bigger lot yet you still want your garage not all the way in the back corner of the lot and so yet i also see kind of the point well do i want to shed really right up next to the side yard of the house and so if i've got an eight foot nine foot side yard i'm going to sneak in a little shed five well so you couldn't do that so in most situations most standard single family lot you're probably not going to have that situation because you're not going to meet the separation from the house and the five foot uh, setback uh, from the side yard, or you have to meet the setbacks of the house. Um, if we were in person, I'd have my flip chart out and I'd be drawing this out for you all. Sorry. But I, I, uh, I think it's one, let us think about that a little bit uh, and we'll kind of map out. Um, it just, it's on a really large lot that this would apply. You're kind of your standard single family, 60 to 70 foot wide lot. You're not gonna see this. Uh, corner lots are covered otherwise, because we call it basically having two front yards. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think we can kind of talk about this a little bit and take that comment into um, account because I think the comment there is talking about sheds um, and we're kind of not differentiating much between a smaller accessory building and a larger accessory building. So um, we can try to strengthen that language a little bit. Yeah. That to help out. So electric car charging station. Um, solar. And this whole accessory structure location is kind of the big things I heard for tonight that we need to do a little more work on. Anything else that everybody listening in uh, wants to ask? So uh, one person was saying that, you know, we do have sheds in the side yards and fill a lot of questions, complaints about that. A garage would be different. Um, oh, maybe we, maybe we just make it special, no sheds. That we only mean say detached garage that's otherwise meeting all the setbacks. Yeah, I think that's a good way to handle it. Um, and then before we get some people to jump off here, Chris, I know you had one last slide that kind of <laughs> talked about next steps. And I want right. to I want to yep. go over that real quick, too, before we start losing a lot of people here. Exactly. Let me just uh, switch screens really quick. One of the big challenges is try to run through this entire code without making you guys just super bored, right? All right. Oh, and then I went too far. Darn it. I knew I'd do that. One more second here. It's a big file, pardon me.
Hopefully that was all worth the wait. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, so next steps. Uh, so after tonight's meeting, we've got some work to do. And so Charlie and I will be uh, working on these questions and updates. Uh, so we do have the Tuesday, May 11th, uh, 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 planning commission meeting scheduled uh, to review this code update and then the earliest it could hit uh, city council for hit public hearing uh, would be the monday june uh, 7th uh, meeting so that is our next steps of course this entire code draft is on the city's website and you can always email uh, charlie uh, or me uh, contact either one of us uh, with your questions and comments uh, definitely look forward to hearing you. So hopefully you learned something new tonight that you can go back and actually read that code in greater detail um, and, and uh, answer any questions having going forward. So uh, with that, any, any final words from anybody? And Chris, really quick, I'll just add, um, you know, you'll see the city council first meeting um, June 7th. And that, of course, is if the Planning and Zoning Commission is able to uh, formulate a recommendation at their May 11th meeting. Um, the soonest the, the council would have their final consideration on this would be um, the first meeting after the 4th of July holiday, which I believe looking at my calendar here is um, July 6. Um, and that's on a Tuesday because of the holiday. So um, this isn't the last step in the feedback uh, that we're looking to get. Again, we have about a two month time period here before the soonest these codes could be adopted. So as Chris mentioned, um, take a look at them. They're available on our website, uh, review them. Uh, please call me at any time with any questions, email me with any questions, um, same with any feedback. Uh, we'll, we'll take all of that in and then we will provide that um, to the commission and, and if we're past that point to the city council during their review. Well said, okay. Well, we definitely appreciate everybody's time tonight, your interest uh, in your code um, and your uh, continued uh, growth in Indianola. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, go, go hit the, the city's uh, website and start reading. All right, thanks again. Thank you so much, Chris. We greatly appreciate all the work you have done and for this presentation. You're welcome.